Nelson pastors the Tab, a thriving ministry in Windsor Mill, Maryland. Called to preach in his teen years and having worked in ministry for more than 20 years, Bishop Jason is passionate about studying God's word and loving God's people. His sensitivity to the presence and voice of the Lord, as well as his ability to release a sound that can shift any atmosphere is unmatched. Bishop Jason is truly a rare gift in the kingdom and such a relevant voice for our time, both in song and through preaching the word of God all over the world. He has a keen ability to dissect the word of God in such a way that is methodical and palatable for all who hear. He teaches the word with remarkable simplicity, conviction, and prophetic authority. Bishop Jason is intentional about empowering others to deepen their relationship with Christ and through practical principles gain access to true abundant living. He encourages believers to shift from mere church attendance to becoming a living sanctuary, establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Bishop Jason is undeniably a phenomenal preacher and teacher, a highly acclaimed gospel artist and a multi-award winner. Yet he considers one of his greatest accomplishments to be his family, his beautiful wife, Tanya, and their children, Jalen Paris and Jason Christopher. Evangel family, let's welcome Bishop Jason Nelson. Join me in the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. While you're turning, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your presence is here. It is undeniable. And we are privileged to be able to sit, to stand, to rest, to enjoy you. Father, our prayer is that you be glorified in this word as, as it is delivered to your people. Father, I pray that you would augment everything that you've given me and translate it to your people in a way that not only rest in their ears, but Father, let it penetrate their hearts. Father, change us from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. And we thank you. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen. I don't know if y'all can hear, I've been dealing with a little bit of a sinus infection. Oh, thank you. I feel a little grainy, but the Lord is our help. Um, 2 Kings chapter 7. Um, I'm going to try to read quickly. But I want to read verses 1 through 7, even though that is not the whole of the pericope that we're going to speak on. But I believe those verses are pertinent to where we are. Here's what verse 1 says. Is, then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour will sell for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, If the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But Elisha said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now four men who were lepers were at the entrance of the city's gate, and they said, to one another, why do we sit here until we die? Why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the army of the Syrians. If they spare us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose in the twilight and went to the Syrian camp. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no man was there. For the Lord had made the Syrian army hear a noise of chariots and horses, the noise of a great army. They had said to one another, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and Egyptian kings to come upon us. So the Syrians arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents, their horses, their donkeys, even the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. But I want to pick my thought from 
this verse. Now the four men who were lepers at the entrance of the city's gate, they said one to another, why do we sit here until we die? You may be seated. Just for a few moments today, I want to talk to you from this subject. It's time to move. Do me a favor, spread that around the room, put it in the comment section, talk to somebody and say, hey, 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 it's time to move. It's time to move. It's time to move. While I was praying about what to preach here, what to say here, this is a little bit of a daunting task because y'all are taught well. So you can't, you can't come, you can't come with, with a lazy word. You got to actually study when you come here. And as I was praying, the Lord led, led, led me to this scripture. And this is one of the things that the Lord says. He, he says, I'm breaking holding patterns and releasing you into your reality. Can you prophesy to two or three people around you and say, God is breaking your holding pattern? Oh, okay. Y'all, y'all said it. I don't know how much power was in it. I said prophesy and y'all kind of just repeated it. Can you find one more person? And I want you to say it like you mean and say, God is breaking holding patterns. And when he breaks your holding pattern, he's releasing you into your truth, into your reality, into your purpose, into the thing God intended for you. And this is what he said, the strangeness attached to stasis has been released. Is there anybody else who's felt stuck? Felt like you've not been moving. Yet you feel, feel, it's like you know something else is supposed to be occurring, but it hasn't happened yet. And, and now you're a little bit frustrated because you ain't moved when you thought you were supposed to move and it didn't change when you thought it was supposed to change. That's what happens when you feel like you're in stasis. But the Lord said, the strangeness of stasis is being released. And here's the truth, and I'm, I'm going to give you the, the, the whole shebang right at the onset. The power of movement cannot be understated regarding both the timing of God and the manifestation of promise. There are some things that you will not get if you're in stasis. There are some things that will not happen if you are not moving. It's all right. Don't, it'll get better in a, in a little while. I, I feel your resistance because God is supposed to do everything, right? I'm not sure that's what the Bible says. The Bible says we have to believe faith without works is dead. So that means that believing is not enough. There must be a corresponding action in order for my faith to be seen. Yes? Okay. Old, old hymnology, hymn is, hymn is said, Lord, hasten the day when my faith shall be sight. Right? Yes? So part of the issue that we face in the current dynamic of the church is we are very, very comfortable believing God, but not as comfortable doing what is necessary for what we're believing for. So movement is a requirement. The concept of movement is innate to our being. Whether you know it or not, while you're sitting still, your atoms are vibrating. You're in movement right now. Literally. Right now. It's innate to your being. The Bible says that we're created in the image and the likeness of God according to Genesis chapter 1. And we understand that God is a moving entity. God is not static. God, watch this, is so important. We're introduced to a moving God, but the particular characteristic of a moving God is very unique in that God is ubiquitous, yet moving at the same time. He's everywhere, but moving. And you would think that if God fills a place, that he would not be able to move in a place. But the characteristic of God is he moves. So even when the place is full of God, he's still moving in that place. And here's what's interesting. If you read the text 
in Genesis 1, his movement is the antecedent to light shining. The Bible says God moved upon the face of the waters and then he said, let there be light and there was light. So movement preceded light. Movement preceded change. Y'all gonna hear this the rest of the sermon that movement precedes change. Matter of fact, we might as well practice it right here. Somebody say it with me. Say movement, movement. precedes change. But this is not a phenomenon that is exclusive to God because he made us to operate as him in the earth. So our movement can also be a catalyst for change. Y'all all right? Okay, let, let, let's dig deep. Y'all, 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 those that know me, y'all know I'm, I'm going to get to my text in a minute. Just ride with me. So here we go. The reality of movement being the antecedent to change is froth through scripture, right? This reality is true in Genesis 12, when God says to Abram, get thee out from thy country, thy kindred, and thy father's house, and go to a place that I will tell you of. So that, watch this, Abraham cannot be birthed out of Abram until Abram moves. That Abram's movement is how Abraham comes to be. That Abram's movement is how Sarai changes into Sarah. Are y'all with me? So that instruction to move, to leave where you are and go to where you belong was a necessary thing for Abraham to come into being. This truth plays out for all of the patriarchs that we know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was true for Abraham. It was true for Isaac. Isaac, the Bible says, had to move in Genesis 26 until he found Rehoboth. He had to move and dig. They strive for it. He moved and dig. They strive for it again. He moved and dig a third time. And the Bible says in his movement, he found room. That you have to move if you want change to occur. Same thing happened with Jacob. Jacob had to cross the Jabbok. Jabbok River. And there on the other side of the Jabbok River, he has an encounter with uh, with the theophany of Jesus. The Bible says there an angel wrestled with him and his name gets changed from Jacob to Israel. That movement precedes change. This is a necessary philosophy that we must embrace because the church does have a habit of getting bogged down, especially when it gets good. A lot, of, a lot of our stagnation in the church is directly attached to what we enjoy for a season. So we think because it's good, we can stay there. But the problem is God is on the move and chasing, this is the manhunt, right? So chasing God where he was is dangerous because God is a moving God. So sometimes in our desire for repetition, we actually lose sight of God because he moved from where we were comfortable. Okay, y'all, y'all don't like that. It, it, it's okay. It's okay. It, it's possible to be in the right place too long. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's possible, watch this, to be with God And then he moves. And if we don't move, it's not that he left us. It's that we chose to stay when he was moving. Ask Joshua in Joshua 3. It's right in the Bible. God says, hey, the ark is about to move. Tell the people when they see the ark moving, you move with the ark. Oh, y'all don't like this. And here's the danger. The danger of a good thing is that a good thing may not be a God thing. And they were on one side of the Jordan River and God said, I need to take you to promise. Promise is over there. But the problem is where they were looked like promise. Because if you're at the bank of of the river Jordan, you receive all of the benefits on both sides. 
But the problem is on the side that they were on, the wilderness is still behind them and still accessible. And God does not want you to retreat when it gets tough. You got to keep moving. Are y'all all right? So movement precedes change. One more time. Movement precedes change. And from this particular ideology, we can find ourselves in the text. That movement precedes change, right? This text may seem counterintuitive to the premise I just laid out because the context of this particular pericope is that Samaria has been put in an enemy-induced stasis. If you read the text, we read the coming out, but we didn't read the previous chapter, but we understand how a whole city got stuck in place. They were surrounded by the Syrian army, and the Syrian army literally, laid, the Bible says, laid siege to Samaria to such a degree that there was no commerce. Nothing went in and nothing came out. So the problem is, when there is no commerce, when there is no flow, you're stuck with what you have. And what you have is going to eventually run out. And it started to run out. And the text shows us the danger of stasis. Blake Snyder coined this phrase. He said, stasis equals death. Stasis equals death. That if you're not careful, remaining sedentary will lead you to your demise. Okay, y- y'all all right? I know I'm slow walking. <clears throat> but but I, I want to make sure that we get this. He says, stasis equals death. So when the Syrian army surrounded Samaria, they caused a cessation of of commerce, and the result was a devastating famine. And the citizens of Samaria were reduced, if you read the the chapter 6, to eating donkey heads and doves dung. That ain't the worst of it. It got so bad they started eating their own children. Oh, go back and read the text. They started eating their own children. The Bible says they boiled. One, one, uh, two ladies came into covenant with each other. They were so hungry. and They both had babies. And they said, today we'll eat your son. Tomorrow we'll eat mine. When the first lady boiled her son, they both had a meal. The second lady said, I can't kill my son. I'm sorry. So, so the first lady went and told the king. Said, king. We made a pact that we were going to have a meal two days in a row. My son and her son, and she won't boil her son for us. The Bible says the king gets grieved. Now, here is what's crazy. Remember, stasis equals death. You know it's bad when you're willing to eat your future. You know you're in famine when, you're, when your future is in jeopardy. Because you're willing to sacrifice tomorrow to fill your belly today. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how much am I willing to sacrifice for my tomorrow? Is your belly making you make decisions that will hurt your future? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So this lady goes to the king and says, we've been eating, we've been eating donkey heads, we've been eating bird poop. It's bad when you, when you season your food with bird poop. I'm, I'm sorry. This ain't, ain't no good way to, to... Dove's dung? Ain't no good way to eat that. But that's how devastating the famine is. And the Bible says that when the famine gets to such a, a point of deprivation and, and scarcity and paucity that the king finally decides to go and have a conversation with the man who speaks on behalf of God. The irritation for me in this text is that they knew where the prophet was, but nobody asked him to speak. Y'all, y'all, y'all miss it. This, this, the, the, the issue is, Elisha has the ability to prophesy. They know he's a prophet. They know that he's a prophet after Elijah. 
They know what he's capable of, but nobody consults him. Isn't it crazy when you know that the word will change you, but you never go to the source of the word? It, 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 isn't, it, isn't it an awful thing to be stuck when you don't need to be stuck? Because all you need is for God to speak on your behalf, but you won't even talk to him? Have you been stuck because you weren't praying? Have you been stuck because you haven't been really digging into the word? Have you been stuck because you haven't heard God? That's one of the issues that we find in this text. Why do I need God to speak? Because when God speaks, things change. I just told you God moved, then he spoke, and things changed. Right? So why do I need a word from God? Why do I need him to speak? Um, Y'all by now know that I am a nerd, and I say it proudly. I even have glasses to prove it now. I've been, I've, I've been rereading this book called Quantum Glory by Phil Mason. And in this book, he makes this statement that shook me. He talks about how God created the earth to have an atmosphere so that sound could be heard. That God made this planet. There are no other planets in the solar system that have the atmosphere that we have. So that sound can be heard. That you need an atmosphere for sound. So God created the earth so that it would be voice activated. Watch this. Then he says this. Here's the statement he made. He said sound has the ability to affect and reconfigure matter. That when God speaks, the word of God has the ability to affect and reconfigure matter. This is why you need God to speak to you. This is why you need God to speak about you. This is why you need a word about your marriage. This is why you need a, a word about your finances. This is why you need a word about your ministry. Because when God speaks, he doesn't just affect it, but he reconfigures matter. Oh boy. It, it, it's a proven fact that sound at the right frequency becomes visible. So God speaks at a frequency where his word becomes manifest. So if I need change, I need God to speak to me about what I'm dealing with. So like Elisha, the Bible says, when the king comes to him, immediately gives a prophecy of deliverance. 24 hours from now, about this time, everything will be changed. It seems insane yeah. Yeah. that you are, you've been stuck for months to the point where you are now in a famine uh -huh. and the word of the Lord is, oh, this will be over in 24 hours. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Now, the reason why some of y'all ain't celebrating is because y'all think I'm just reading scripture. It's cool though. It's cool though. Let, 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 let me see if I can rephrase. Can I prophesy that according to the word of the Lord, in less than 24 hours. What has been stuck will be moving. In less than 24 hours. The famine in your life, whether it is financial, whether it is relational, whether it is emotional, in less than 24 hours. He prophesies and says, this time tomorrow, the famine is over. I need a hundred folk to just prophesy over your own life and say the famine is over. The famine is over. That's the word of the Lord for somebody that I'm talking to today. The famine is over. This man declares a word that the famine is over to a city that is gripped by famine. I'm eating donkey heads and you talking about the famine is over. Dove's dung and you talking about the famine is over. How are you prophesying something 
with no proof whatsoever that the exit is that close. Can y'all hear me? I'm trying to tell you that the exit is way closer than you think it is. That the way out is so much closer than you think it is. Here it is. He says, he spoke prophetically about the proof in such demonstrable language that it seemed unbelievable to one of the men who heard it. He said, yeah, tomorrow about this time, they'll be selling flour for a shekel and bread for a shekel and there's going to be a fire sale for all the good, the good stuff. What would you do? Let me speak to the ladies for a minute. I know this is manhunt day, but let me speak to the ladies for a minute. What would you do if you got an email that said tomorrow, all the Louis stuff you've been trying to get is 99% off? How, how, oh, see, see, see. How would you respond if Louboutin had a sale? Y'all won't talk back to me. Okay. Is it, the, the women praying me. Let me talk to the guys. I'm here for y'all anyway. It's all, it's all right. It's all right. Y'all can do me how y'all do me. It's all right. Let me talk to the guys for a minute. What, what would you do if that midlife crisis car, that convertible you ain't talked to your wife about, was on sale for 99% off? How would you respond if that Porsche Panamera, you could purchase it for $1,000 instead of $100,000? It, 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 it seems a little ridiculous that something that I've always wanted would be available at a price that anybody could afford. The Bible says that the armor bearer of the king decides he wants to put his hat in the ring. And he says, man, you crazy. I mean, this ain't King James. This, let me Jason ask for a minute. Man, you crazy. Ain't no way. Ain't no way what you said could come to pass. God would have to literally open up the windows of heaven for us to get close to what you just prophesied. And here's the problem with doubt. Doubt is always loud when there is no proof. But that's why your faith has to be substantiated by God's history, not proof. Try it one more time. The reason why I believe God is because every other time I believe God, he came through. The reason why I trust him is because the last time he told me he would bring me out, guess what he did? He brought me right on out. The last time he told me he would heal me, guess what he did? He went ahead and healed me. The last time he said he would give me the money, guess what he did? He provided the finances. So when he tells me something ridiculous, I don't chide him. I go, okay, is it, that's what you say? That's what you say? I don't know how it's going to happen. But how ain't up to me. Here's what's crazy. The armor bearer decides to speak out of turn and the prophet says, okay, cool. He says, how about this? Since you decided to verbalize your doubt, you'll be able to see it, but you won't eat any of it. This is why you don't run after people who try to convince you that what God said ain't what God said. Your response is, okay, when it happens, you won't get any of it. Don't worry about it. It's cool. So here's what he says. He says, you'll, you'll see it, but you won't eat of it. And then inexplicably, the text changes and starts talking about four lepers. From a literary perspective, that's what we call a non sequitur where there is a change in the dialogue, but there is no, uh, nothing to connect one thing to the other. It just seems like it doesn't belong in the text. And it says, and four lepers are now having a conversation about dying or not dying. It's really interesting that these four lepers start having this conversation about 
Why sit here until we die? For leprous men. Now let's talk about leprosy for a quick second then I'm, and I'm almost done. Don't, don't tell me to take my time. You know better. Don't, don't do that. Let, let's talk about these, these four leopards. Leprosy was in, in antiquity an incurable disease except by miracle. If you contracted leprosy, you were going to die from leprosy unless God intervened. Literally, that's it. So watch this. And I'm, and I'm talking about for hundreds of years, when you got leprosy, it was a death sentence. But leprosy didn't, doesn't always kill you quickly. Leprosy is a progressive disease that the longer you have it, the worse you get. Leprosy is so, it's such a horrible disease that it dries up the digits of your fingers. Your fingers fall off. The tendons in your body begin to shrink. It, when leprosy gets really bad, your nose literally dries up and falls off of your face. Leprosy is a crazy disease. So it makes it even more profound that four lepers make a decision to move. Because movement for lepers is painful. These four lepers made a decision that despite how I feel, I'm not ready to die. Okay, y'all miss this. I'm, I'm going to give it to you one more time. Because some of us are on the verge of giving up because of how you feel. But you got to make a determination that regardless of how I feel, I ain't ready to die yet. I need everybody in the room to say, I'm not ready to die yet. See how y'all played me? That wasn't even right. Try it one more time and say it with power. Say, I'm not ready to die yet. There is still something God has for me. We were just worshiping on there. So much more to the story. He's not done with me yet. If that's true, you got to make a decision despite pain. They're sitting at the gate. And the gate is a place of transaction. It is a place of change. They're sitting at a place of change and they made a decision that if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, death is there. But what would happen if we decided today to go and throw ourselves on the mercy of our enemies? What would happen? Because here, here's what we know. The Bible is, it is very clear that what the Syrians have been doing is, watch this, not consuming all of the commerce that was supposed to go to Samaria. They've been collecting it. So they have more than enough for the city to survive, but they're not letting it get to the city. So these four lepers make a determination. Worst that can happen is they don't feed us and we die. But what I'm not going to do is die without trying. But what I'm not going to do is sit here and do nothing because stasis equals death. So what we're going to do is let's, let's just try. Let, let, let's try and see what happens. I'm preaching harder than y'all responding. It's okay. I'm going to give y'all one more shot. Here, here is what they said. Let's try and see what happens. Could it be that the next phase of your life is not going to happen because of a certainty? It's going to happen because you decided to try. There are no guarantees, but I'm going to try. I don't have anybody backing me, but I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to try. And God blessed their try. What if you just give God something to work with? Good God Almighty. What, what, what if you just decide, you know what? Being still ain't working for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move. The Bible says they decided to move. And I can imagine that these men 
are not moving fast because they're lepers. These are not the 10 in, the, in, in Luke where Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest and they were healed as they went. This, this ain't this situation. They stayed lepers. But they said, I'm not going to be a dead leper. And I can imagine them halting, looking like Frankenstein, moving slowly. Four men, eight feet on the way to the enemy. And the Bible says they moved at twilight, which is the time in between day and night, where your vision is obscured because of how the sun is setting on the land. So you can't, they could not be seen by the enemy. But the Bible says they were heard by the enemy. I need y'all to understand that God will position you in such a way where stealth is your grace. Where nobody can see what's happening. You're doing a whole bunch, but nobody in the front sees it. It's all happening behind the curtain. There are some things right now, I, I need y'all to hear me, there are some things right now that y'all have been praying about that you don't see, but it's happening behind the scenes. The Bible says they're moving at twilight and at twilight while they're moving towards the Syrian army, the Syrian army hears them, which is unconscionable because how can an army hear four men, eight feet, walking? That doesn't make sense. That math don't math. That eight feet are heard by an army. But the Bible says that God amplified the sound of their move. One more time. God amplified the sound of their feet moving to such a degree that they thought they heard the sound of two armies coming after them. I'm trying to tell you that when you make a decision to move, God says, I'll amplify it. I won't amplify it if you're being still. But if you decide to make a move, if you decide to try, if you decide to move your feet, if you decide to put together a plan, if you decide to work on the blueprints, if you decide to move, look at your neighbor and say, it's time to move. Oh, oh, oh. Let me get out of here. It's time to move. The Lord is adding speed. He's adding weight. He's adding depth. He's adding sound to everything you do. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing? You still chilling? Are you doing something? You still waiting for somebody else to do it? Okay. Wait, 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 wait. So here, here's the problem. As you, all, as you all should know by now, the Lord has declared revival. The earth is in revival. Even, with, even what you see in the political arena is a sign that the earth is in revival. I ain't going, I'm just saying, it's a sign that the earth is in revival. So watch this, the impetus to revival is often found in individuals who are willing to be vessels that carry the embers of the fire that will be the substrata for a move of God that will have wide-ranging and even global effects that somebody has to take their fire somewhere else. And when you take your fire, your fire becomes the embers for the flame of somebody else. Are you with me? Every generation needs a firebrand. For many, a reluctance has overtaken them to operate on the cutting edge of revival. We don't want to be at the front of revival. We want to enjoy the wave of revival, but we don't want to be in the front of revival. They look for somebody else to fill the gap and would rather move after things are already in motion. But there is an expectation that this people 
will reject the notion of riding on the coattails of others and become the initiators of the next move of God, not just in this church, but in this region. But that only happens when you do something, when you move. You want God to expand the church, but you ain't moving. You say the church should be bigger than what it is. It's probably true. How much movement are you doing? How many men are you hunting? Okay, here it is. Why sit we here and die? I'm not going to settle for premature death. I don't have to die here. I'm moving. When they move, the Lord amplifies their footsteps. Eight feet sound like an army, and God multiplies them. So watch this. When they get to the camp, all of the Syrian army is gone. Them jokers said, we ain't never come to fight. They ran. And what's crazy is they ran on foot. They left all the horses. They left all the donkeys. They left all the camels. The thing that would give them speed, they left. And that also means they left carrying nothing. So the camp is as flush with food and supplies and gold and silver and precious things. And these four lepers become rich lepers. Okay, y'all missed it. Some of us right now, we want God to change us and give us something else. But what happens if God says, the testimony is, I left the burden, but I blessed you. I didn't take away the pain, but, I, but I, I gave you finances. I didn't take away the pain, but in the midst of your experience, I gave you something that would be a benefit to other people. He did not take their leprosy away. But there's some rich lepers. And they're full. The Bible says they go from, from tent to tent. Taking stuff and hiding it. Taking stuff and hiding it. Taking stuff and hiding it. And then they finally decided to have another conversation. Say, we ain't doing right. Let me put it in our, in, in our context. God been too good and I ain't told nobody about it. God has made ways that I've been testified. God has opened doors and I've been keeping it a secret. God healed me, but I ain't tell nobody about it. God paid off my house, but I never told anybody how God did it. And they said, we're not doing well. We need to go and tell the king. Because the salvation of Samaria is in a Syrian camp and nobody's guarding it. Now remember, God said in 24 hours, the lepers were not privy to the prophecy. Say that one more time. Let's say it over here to y'all. The lepers were not privy to the prophecy. They had no idea what God said. But they were the catalyst for what God said to come to pass. I'm trying to tell you, my voice is gone. I'm trying to tell you that we're in a season right now where God is going to use people you ain't never met. He's going to use people that don't know what he said to you. And they're going to be the reason why your life turns around. They're going to be the reason why the ministry explodes. They're going to be the reason. There are people right now, I feel the Holy Ghost. There are people right now in the political arena, in the government, who are calling his name and he don't even know it. Because God has declared that the famine is over. So they go back. They have to walk back to Samaria. And they tell the king, say, hey, I'm trying to tell you everything you need in that camp. Now, mind you, they have hidden their stuff already. Because y'all ain't going to take everything and not bless the lepers. <laughs> Bible says the king is wary of their words because of how lepers are treated. I don't even have time to deal with that. But, but because lepers are treated so badly 
They were like, they might be trying to get us. Because we dogged them every day. We in a famine and still dog them. So he sends out a few people on horseback to go and check. And they come back and say, hey, everything they said is true. All the food you need, all the money you need, all of the commerce that has been held up, watch this, is just sitting there. Y'all missed it one more time. Everything that didn't come to you in the last season has not been consumed. It's just sitting there. Good God Almighty. I need you to touch two or three people and say you have lost nothing. Everything that God promised you is still yours. Everything he spoke over you is still yours. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody getting a release right here. Every promise that he gave you is still good. Okay, your neighbor ain't helping you. Talk to yourself and say, I have lost nothing. I feel the glory right here. We have lost nothing. I missed my window. That devil lied. You've lost nothing. When an opportunity passed, no, it didn't. You've lost nothing. The challenge is, if you want to see the benefit of the famine being over, you can't be still. You got to move. If you want to see the healing, you can't be still. You got to move. If you want to see the deliverance, you can't be still. You have to move. Because movement precedes change. And what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is doing now in this season is he's putting the onus back on you. He said, I said what I, was, what I, what I said. I, I, I prophesied. I've already spoken. My word is good. Thy word, O oh Lord, is forever settled in heaven. God does not need to speak again. He spoke. Why haven't you gotten it? Because you're still where you were when he spoke it. You haven't changed. You haven't done anything different. And it's not that God is a liar. Is that you're out of position to get it. Those four lepers could not discover what was in the Syrian camp if they stayed at the gate. It's time for Evangel to move. And I'm not talking about buying a new building, even though that may be in the plans. I'm talking about motion in your ideology, giving feet to the vision. We can't be still and see all that God has for us. It is impossible. It's impossible. And the frustration of your past season is over. I'm going to say that again. The frustration of your past season is over. Question is, what are you going to do about it? How will you respond? Are you going to do something? Or are you just going to sit here and act like everything's cool when you know it's not? Why sit there and die? Why sit there and your dreams expire? Why sit there and you never see the fulfillment of what God told you and it's not that you can't be it, it's not that you can't do it, it's that you're just sitting there waiting for it to just happen. And we have a responsibility So today, this is what I need you to do. It's just an act of faith. And I, I very rarely do this, but it's just an act of faith. What I want you to do today, I want you to get up from your seat. And I want you to step two or three steps in any direction. Because what we're doing prophetically is we're giving God something to amplify. By faith, change is happening. 
By faith, healing is occurring. By faith, college is paid for. By faith, the ministry is funded. By faith, the opportunity is coming. By faith. Now while you're moving, I want you to open up your mouth and I want you to release a praise of anticipation. I believe God is doing it. I believe he's answering me. I believe he's sending help. I believe my name is being spoken in arenas I've not yet entered. I believe it. by faith that as you're moving change is happening as you're moving deliverance is happening as you're moving the doctor's report is changing as you're moving the bank account is being filled as you're moving ministry is happening as you're moving God is birthing something in your spirit as you're moving he's giving you vision for your tomorrow as you're moving <laughs> 